Well, it's kind of interesting that uh, the message today is called the Arab-Israeli conflict. Here we are in Genesis 16. <laughs> and we probably need to make a, a distinction right away. Uh, the Arabs are the descendants of Ishmael, we'll see, which means they are half Hebrew and half Egyptian. Uh, again, Abraham is not Jewish. That word doesn't even come along uh, for uh, a later time. It comes from the word Judah, who hasn't even been born yet. But remember from our earlier studies in, in, uh, in Genesis, those that crossed over the Euphrates River turned their back on idolatry to walk with the one true God. The descendants of Eber became the Hebrew people. So truly, Abraham is a Hebrew. He is the father of Ishmael. Hagar, we're going to be uh, introduced to, the Egyptian handmaiden of Sarah, uh, is the mother. And uh, that is where the Arab people come from. Which is, which is not uh, uh, all the people in the Middle East by any stretch of the imagination. Again, the, uh, the Iranians and uh, many of the Iraqis are Persian by descent. The Saudi Arabians, even though they have that name uh, in their na title, are not Arab either. And of course, the Egyptians are Egyptians. And uh, uh, in Israel today, there's many Arabs that live there, many of whom are Christians that uh, live in Nazareth and uh, uh, some of the other uh, uh, cities around uh, Israel. On our first tour to Israel, our bus driver was, uh, was Arab, spoke uh, Hebrew fluently, was very thankful that he lived in the only democracy at that time uh, in the Middle East. And uh, so we kind of have this uh, uh, idea sometimes and, and can wrongfully equate Arab with Islam, with terrorism, but uh, hopefully by the time we're done with the, merit, the message, we'll understand that the father of the Arabs with Ishmael in his name means God sees. And we're going to see one of the great, uh, great episodes in the Old Testament of God's mercy and grace uh, and what he has to say about this particular child and his mother in a very desperate time. Well, first note that... Um, <laughs> You know, again, if I'm writing the Bible, this chapter's not in here. <laughs> yeah, this is another one of where Abraham totally blows it. And we're looking really at the life of Abraham from chapter 12 to 22 when he follows God's call to leave Ur the Chaldeans uh, and follow him. In partial obedience, he makes it out of town, but with his family, he's not supposed to take, doesn't make it all the way, ends up in Haran where he stays till his father Terah dies, eventually follows God again, out of that partial obedience, still God calls him and draws him, brings him to the land that we know as Israel today, the land of Canaan. And he does uh, some incredible things of faith, building altars, proclaiming the name of the Lord and so forth. Uh, we see these high plateaus of his faith. And then we see him do some really stupid things like go to Egypt and, uh, and suffer the consequences uh, there uh, because of his lack of faith. We see him come back and get right with God. Now, I know this doesn't happen to any of you. We're just, for, for theory's sake, following this along with, uh, with Abraham. Uh, so he comes back again. He gets back on track with God once, once again. And then last week in uh, chapter 15, or excuse me, two weeks ago when we were there, we see, the, again, this high point where God comes and condescends to come down to Abraham's level, where he literally cuts covenant with him again, where these animals are basically cut in two. God's presence uh, in, the, uh, in, a, in a flame passes between them, saying that uh, if I do not keep my promise in my word, my integrity is based on the covenant I'm making with you. May this happen to me, what has happened to these animals. Abraham fully anticipating that he would then get up and walk through as well, so he would have to keep his part of the deal. But God keeps him, in a sense, on the ground, he is not able to do that. God's saying, this is all me. You know, my covenant with you is one of grace. My promise to you is unconditional and it's eternal. And of course, part of that promise was not only to Abraham and his physical descendants, the land and the seed and the blessing, but through him, he would raise up a nation through whom kings would come, through whom eventually the Messiah would come, Jesus Christ, who would be a blessing to the whole world. At that point, Abraham's faith is probably off the charts. I don't know how much time went by, but I don't think it's a lot of time when we get to chapter 6, given the age. It's, it's not a year or anything. It's, it's weeks or it's months. And uh, we arrive here at chapter 16, verse 1. There's a decision to have a child by another, another wife. 
Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has, re, uh, has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. And then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, uh, Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived... And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. So uh, again, there's a decision that is made. The first thing is that we note that it's Sarah's idea. She wants to do what is legal. She wants to do what is customary, not only in Mesopotamia, but in Egypt as well. She wants to do what is socially acceptable, but of course it is against God's moral will. From the beginning, it was one man, one woman. Again, acceptable. Jacob would do the same thing later, of course. He would end up being tricked by Laban, you remember, and marries Leah, but he really wanted Rachel, so now he's got two wives. Rachel's unable to conceive, so she does the same thing. She gives her handmaiden uh, so that uh, she would have children by her. Again, this thing was, uh, was thought to be socially, culturally acceptable, but it was never accepted by by God. Uh, there's kind of an in interesting mixture of, uh, of selflessness as well as selfishness in what Sir Sarah is trying to do here. Uh, you have to think about it. She's willing to give up this very special intimate relationship with her husband and say, hey honey, you just take another wife and you can have kids by her and I just get the kid and, and we're all good. Uh, their relationship obviously would never be the same again. It seems selfless, and it is in that sense, but, uh, but not totally, because we'll see it's so that I can have a child she wants to conceive. The decision, again, her idea, accepted by Abraham, now 85 years old. He's been walking with the Lord for 10 years, learning some valuable lessons, and, uh, and one of them uh, was this idea of waiting for God's timing and, uh, and doing things God's way. In terms of why did God wait so long, two reasons. The writer of Hebrew tells us in uh, Hebrews eleven twelve that God waited so that the body of Abraham and Sarah, in terms of bearing children, would be as good as dead. In other words, so that nobody would say, amazing, Abraham and Sarah just conceived. They're having a baby. That's amazing. No, <laughs> God wants them to say, that's a miracle. <laughs> That's a miracle because their bodies are as good as dead at this point. And the problem that we'll see in our text is that they're not, are they? Abram is able to father this child at 86 years old. Nobody's going to look at Ishmael and go, "That's a miracle." They're just going to go, "They're going to go, that's pretty amazing, Abraham." But they're not going to go, "That's a that's a miracle." And God wanted the glory from this. He wanted the glory from this child. A lot of times God, God is delaying. We often talk about Lazarus, you know, being in the tomb for four days and Jesus delaying. Why? So it would be clear to everyone that he is dead as dead as dead so that when Jesus raises him from the dead, God would get the glory from it. The second thing that was going on here is that while Abraham and Sarah were waiting, God was working. <laughs> and and uh, of course, we don't like this part where we're waiting uh, God asking us to be patient with him and so forth. We kind of want everything done now. I don't mind having problem, uh, having problem having faith in the Lord as long as he's working on my time schedule. I just have problems when it's on his time schedule. James says, tells us in the New Testament, let patient have its, patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking nothing. Apparently, there's something of God working in our lives where it only happens if we're able to wait and during those times when we need to trust him. God is working in both of their lives while he's waiting. The decision, again, is based on a failure of faith. 
Sarah decides to, to do this in her part. She's second-guessing God. She's concerned not for the glory of God, but for the glory of self. And, you know, when we do a little thing and we talk about decision-making, and there's some principles that we've been able to draw out of uh, Abraham's life in the past, but one of them, that question to ask is, does it bring God the glory? I got a decision to make. You know, there, there was a whole series of questions. Is it a sin in the Bible? You know, uh, you know do I have a piece about it? There was uh, about 10 of them that we kind of go through. But one of them, does it bring glory to God? Is this going to bring glory to God? Eh, no, it's, it's not. It's not at all. But she wants to do it anyway. It's her idea. Notice the almost disappointment with God that we see in her that leads to this in verse 2. See now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. It literally means the Lord has closed my womb. That's the problem here. So we have a promised child coming. God has a covenant with you. God spoke to you. God says you're supposed to have a son. So you have a son because it's not going to happen with me. Uh, it's a failure of faith, but there seems to be a little bitterness here. Uh, and certainly that can become an issue with us too when God doesn't do what we anticipate and what we want him to do. When our expectations don't meet his purposes, uh, we need to be careful. We can grow bitter. And it seems like Sarah uh, is doing that here. In terms of uh, Abraham's failure of faith, well, again, it was perfectly legal. It was culturally acceptable, but he totally had to know better. I mean, uh, I don't think he was really, you know, in his quiet time with the Lord. Well, Lord, you know, Sarah brought up this idea. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of rolling this over in my mind. What are you thinking here, Lord? And, of course, the Lord is going, you're an idiot, you know, or some other. I'm sure it was in he whatever the Hebrew word it was, you know. But um, the, uh, or that theological term, you know, baloney, you know, for baloney. You know, it's, it's something like, you know, I, I, I think he knows what God is going to say. I, I don't know if you, if you have prayers that you never say because you're pretty sure what God's going to say. <laughs> so you just don't even go there. And then you do it anyway. And they go, oh, man. <laughs> Should have known better than that. Well, he, he knew better than that. Um, also interesting, Sarah's action, uh, very parallel to that of Eve in the garden. Again, Moses, our very skilled writer here that we've pointed out many times. Notice that Abram listens to his wife just as Adam listened to his wife. Uh, Sarah took Hagar just as Eve took the fruit. Uh, uh, Sarai gave Hagar to her husband just as Eve gave the fruit to hers. And in both cases, the man willingly and knowingly partook. Uh, can you tell there's no good guys in this story? <laughs> no, nobody gets off the, off the hook here. And uh, uh, one little commentary. Sammy mentioned last week that, that God refers to uh, Hagar as the wife of Abraham. Of course, maybe that's because he's Egyptian. But I just want to point out that the Bible never says that. Now, Sarah says, you take her to be your wife. But every time God makes reference to her, well, in verse 8, it's Sarah's maid. In chapter 21, verse 10, it's Abraham's wife. and uh, it's, uh, it's not Abraham's wife. It's the bondwoman and her son. And we'll read that passage in a moment. And I went ahead and did a little search. Every time God is speaking and refers to Hagar, it's always the bond servant. It's always the maid servant. It is never the wife. Of God never recognized this marriage. Paul tells us in Romans 14 that whatever is not of faith uh, is sin, and certainly this was. It was legal. There's, there's a lot of sin that's legal uh, that you can uh, commit out there, but it's, uh, it's not moral. So God rejects the entire enterprise because he had something better. He had something better in mind for them. I mean, he had something awesome in mind for them. If they had just waited, if they had just trusted the Lord, and I wonder how many times that we, we jump ahead of God because we grow impatient and we miss his best for us. Well, this decision obviously is regretted later. Verse 5, then Sarai said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. Just to make that clear, the New Living Bible says, then Sarai says to Abram, this is all your fault. <laughs> Just so we're, we're clear on what she's saying, saying to him. Uh, and you know what? She was absolutely right. Her idea, all his fault. Proverbs 30, verse 21 says, For three things the earth is perturbed or shaken. Yes, for it cannot bear up. For a servant, when he reigns, a fool, when he is filled with food, 
Maybe that's why I feel the earth shaking every time I'm, uh, you know, after, maybe not. A hateful woman when she is married and a maidservant who succeeds her mistress. So the earth begins to shake as Abraham and Sarai begin to treat Hagar like she's an inanimate object uh, at the outcome of her pregnancy. She becomes proud, Sarai says, I have become despised in her eyes. That word despised is the same word as curse. In the Abrahamic covenant, familiar verse, I will bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curse you. It's the same word. And it continues that way. So, like you see, there's, there's nobody you can get behind and kind of root for in this story. Sarai, or Sarah is totally blowing it with the whole concept and the idea, bringing it up. Abraham's doing the typical guy husband thing. Well, okay, honey, whatever you think. <laughs> you know, he, he's not going to the Lord. He's not thinking about what God would want. He's not thinking about what would be the best for their marriage, for their family. So he's kind of checked out. He's just kind of doing the typical guy thing. Sorry, guys. Uh, but he, that's what he's doing here. And then she comes along. She's kind of the victim in the whole thing. Hagar, she gets pregnant. As soon as she gets pregnant, she's showing. Then she's like to Sarah, aha. You know, did you like that with Sammy last week? Aha. But anyway, she... She's kind of laying into her, a cursing upon her because of the fact that she has this, this new status. So Sarah says, the Lord judge between me and you. She blames Abraham and she makes an appeal to God. The Lord judge between me and you. Again, he was the patriarch. He was the head of the house. God had spoken to him and not her. Uh, he should have never allowed this situation. Abram was responsible for the, and when it says the wrong that was committed, the word wrong in Hebrew can also mean the violence that she was suffering. And so she cries, may the Lord judge between me and you. So Abram's solution wasn't a good one. As I said, his solution was to, you know, Sarah, Sarai says, well, I want to get rid of her. He goes, whatever. I mean, that's, that's his solution. Whatever. Uh, honey, whatever you think, that's fine with me exhorting wonderful spiritual leadership, leadership and headship in the home. What should have Abraham done? He should have taken Sarah aside, assured her of his love and that she would always be first. He should have accepted full blame and responsibility and he should have dealt kindly but firmly with Hagar. I mean, it's the deed is done, uh, the bad decision is made, the consequences must be accepted and then live with uh, at that point the best that they could now the problem was not him listening to his his wife um, girls you might want to underline this verse we're going to go to genesis 21 verse 12 the situation certainly as as uh, isaac is born and he begins to grow up and you got ishmael is the uh, the older stepbrother and they're kind of getting into it and problems continue uh, and this time uh, the situation is a little different Sarah, Sarah's got an idea, but Abraham goes to the Lord, chapter 21, verse 12. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah said to you, listen to her voice. I thought maybe the gals might want to underline that part. Uh, whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because... He is your seed. Again, notice when God makes reference to Hagar, it's never as a wife. It's always as the bond woman. But notice also the difference this time. Sarah has this idea. Hey, why don't you take my handmaiden? We'll make her your wife and you can have a child with her. Okay, honey, sounds good to you. This time Sarah comes to him and goes, I've got a, I've got a good idea. I think they need to go because they're creating problems, not only for me, but for our son as well. And this time, Abraham says, well, honey, let me pray about it. And that's what he does. And then God says, she's telling you right, the right advice this time. Yeah, do what she says. Just a little tip there, guys. So it's not that you don't listen, but you need to listen to everything your wife has to say. But you've got to go to God. And what does God's word say? What does the Lord have to say? And in this case, uh, the Lord tells him to listen to his wife. Uh, Interesting, one of the ancient, most ancient laws that we have, the laws of Hammurabi, actually one of them state the fact that 
uh, in this culture at that time legally, you could actually do what has transpired here. You could take your wife's maidservant, elevate her to a position to be your wife, have a child from her, but if she ever displeased you, you could dismiss her and make her your slave once again. So in a sense, that's what Abraham's doing. Again, legal, culturally acceptable, uh, maybe not the best thing. The, uh, the thing that shouts the loudest in the story here is the, the lack of honorable character from, from anyone. Ken Hughes says, Abram was the worst. He was a pathetic, passive, impudent, and uncaring of either woman. Neither woman had any compassion on the other. Sarai was the worst, but yet the idea that Hagar would have done the same thing if she could, notwithstanding Hagar was the prime victim. Bad decision. <laughs> Bad bad decision and uh and boy when we make them are these godly people here yeah absolutely are they walking with the lord yes they are have they done some amazing things in terms of leaving their their home and everything they know to follow god based on god's voice and god's promise to them yes they did uh have they done some wonderful things i mean this is abraham who raises up these 318 guys in his own household and when lot gets uh uh, captured by, remember, the king, uh, the king of Iraq and uh, Iran and the four kings from uh, uh, the kings from southern Turkey. He makes off with them, catches them in the middle of the night near Damascus, 100 miles away, and, uh, and rescues everybody, brings them all back. He gives uh, the tithe to Melchizedek. I mean, he's done some awesome things. But uh, I just want to scare you a little here. Just because you're doing well, David did pretty well for quite a while too, didn't he? And then one day he's on his rooftop where he shouldn't have been because he should have been with his men out fighting because that was the position of the king in that day. He was no civilian leader like we have. He was supposed to be out there with those guys, and he wasn't. And then he sees Bathsheba because Satan waited very patiently for many years and knew what David's weakness was because he'd already exposed it. Because he did the same thing, marrying other women when he shouldn't have, and God forbid him to do it, he did it anyway. Satan goes, I got this guy. I'll just wait a year, 10 years, 20 years. I'll wait, and I'll get him, and he did. You need to be very careful. I've got a good friend of mine in the ministry that at the, his early 70s fell into sexual sin and is no longer in the ministry. I mean, you can kind of think that, hey, I... I can, I'm going to put it on cruise control here at some point in time in my Christian experience. I've been walking with the Lord for several years or 10 years or a couple of decades. There's a real enemy out there, and we need to be very careful. And sometimes, in this case, it's, I don't even know if this was a temptation. It was just a dumb decision. We need to be very careful that we're putting the Lord first in our lives because it leads to problems. Well, the good thing in uh, verses 7 to 14, God intervenes on all of their behalf. Verse 7, now the angel of the Lord found her, this is Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also been seen, have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore, the well was called Be'er Lahai Roy. Uh, observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. So, uh, this divine intervention does save the life of Hagar and the child. The angel finds her here. Now, you know, I think I've read this a lot of times, and I, I finally went to a map to go, how far did she get? Because I think I have it in this uh, Hollywood pictorial thing in my mind, you know, that, you know, uh, Hagar, you know, I don't know what she, kicks her out, basically. Uh, and she kind of goes over a couple of sand dunes, falls down and cries out before the Lord. Uh, that's not exactly what happened. She's like over 100 miles away. She's down on the Sinai Peninsula. She's about ready. She's going back to daddy. She's like, 
She's ready to cross the border back into Egypt once again. Once again. Pregnant gal, I don't know how long. Could she do 10, 10 miles a day? I don't know if she went a straight shot. She had to be at this for 12, 14, 15 days maybe to get that far. So what, it wasn't like this. She leaves and kind of falls on the ground an hour later. Hey, Ali, Ali, oxen free. Just come on back. That's, that's not what's happening here. Uh, this is a woman who is pregnant in a desert setting, completely alone, totally depressed, uh, having thought that she had something and now lost everything. That's me. It does happen. But I'm not going to answer it. No, I better, in case they call back again, I, I do forget to do this once in a while. This would be an appropriate time if you have a cell phone to... Uh... <laughs> Sound is now off. <clears throat> only happened one other time. I usually get it. Silence. Only happened one other time. Go and tell the story. Only happened one other time. I was in the middle of teaching on prayer and accessibility to God, and my phone rang. And I pulled it out, and it was Josh. And I hadn't seen him in a while, so I answered it, talked to him. And then I told him, hey, I've got to go. I'm in the middle of a sermon. Oh, you're kidding, because he's like five-hour time difference. And see, that's accessibility. That's prayer. That's what God gives us. But... Uh, God is watching, and evidently, he has a real sense of humor here, doesn't he? Because that's what she names him. You're the God who sees. Well, let's go back to this. So she's, she's a good 100 miles away. She travels from Abraham's camp to Beersheba through Kadesh Barnea to the Bitter Lakes. And if you've got a Bible uh, with the maps in the back, you can look at it later. But uh, you'll see how far she made it. Uh, and so she's in a very desperate place, a def uh, desperate condition. And then the identity of the angel himself, first time uh, it appears, the angel of the Lord uh, is said also of the angel of the Lord that comes to Abraham uh, as he's about ready to go and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. The angel of the Lord appears to Joshua before he's going to go in and destroy uh, the uh, Jericho and so forth. And if you track the angel of the Lord, eventually he is named as Jehovah or Yahweh. This is God. Uh, and therefore, many believe, as I do, that it's a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Uh, what makes that interesting is that the grace that is in this. Again, there are those that say, I love the New Testament, not so much the Old Testament, because I love, you know, all those parts about God's grace. I don't think they're reading the same Bible I'm reading, because this is incredible grace. Here's this slave woman who's pregnant. She's in the desert somewhere trying to get back home again, in the middle of nowhere, about ready to die possibly. And God shows up and basically says, I see you and I care about you and I know all about your situation. You're pregnant. You're going to have a son. I want you to name him this. God hears. I've seen your affliction. I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless him. It may not seem like it right now. Nobody would have predicted this. You feel like a total outcast? I'm going to raise up a tremendous nation and a people under you. Uh, it's just a, it's an amazing picture of, uh, of God's grace and God's love to a, a woman and to uh, an unborn child. Uh, the divine intervention, again, includes predictions, as I just mentioned. Uh, the name Ishmael, God hears. Uh, though this son would not enjoy the covenant blessings that uh, Isaac would, he would still enjoy the blessing of God upon his life. His descendants would be multiplied into uh, great nations. We'll see that he has 12 sons, 12 princes uh, who become nations under him. And of course, then, as we said at the beginning, Ishmael becomes the founder of the Arab people. Uh, two concerns about her son. Uh, he would be a wild man. <laughs> NIV says he'll be a wild donkey of a man. Uh, not a flattering description of your soon-to-be son, born son. Uh, but again, speaking of his character uh, and uh, the fact that he would be very individualistic uh, and, um, and not really hold to social convention and so forth. Very interesting, uh, among the Arab people in the world today are the Bedouins that live in, uh, in Israel who still refuse to move into a building. Uh, they live in tents, and it gets a little chilly there in Israel. Uh, they're the shepherds and so forth. Uh, the uh, government of Israel have actually built them, you know, houses and apartment complexes for them and stuff, but they don't, they don't use them. They don't move in. They would 
you'd rather move in their tent. Now, what's kind of classic, though, uh, is that you can see this blue glow in a satellite dish. So they've got, they're in a tent, but they've got a sat, a sat dish and, uh, and big uh, flat screen TVs and very often a Mercedes that they're driving out front. So it's kind of a st strange way, but very independent people here that we're talking about. Uh, that was predicted by God. We see it today in Israel. He would be a hated man living in hostility towards his brothers. So he would live among his brothers. That is the descendants of Isaac, uh, the Jewish people, which they still do today. And there would be continual conflict between them. Uh, we're all clear that that's, that came true. That that's still an issue today. So two things of concern as well as two aspects of the blessing that would be upon him. The divine intervention also came as a result of Hagar's uh, affliction. Verse 12, because the Lord has heard your affliction. Uh, she sees God as being a personal God. She sees God as a God who is concerned about abused people and unborn babies. Uh, quite a statement in the, the culture that we live in, in now. He knows the future. Uh, he cares for her. She, at this point, is willing to trust him. And at this point, she's the only person in the Bible that gives God a name. You know, God reveals himself and says, my name is. You shall know me as Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, all these different names. Adonai, whatever it is. This is the only time that God shows up and somebody says, I'm giving you a name. And it's pretty much like, okay, what would that be? You're the God who sees and cares. I can live with that. And uh, okay, then you name your son Ishmael. God hears. You carry that on. She's like, okay, I'm going to name the well after you as well. Okay, I'm all right with that. The, not that they're the vernacular, but it's very interesting. This Egyptian handmaiden cast out by Abraham and Sarah is a, one of the only persons, the only person in the Bible to actually give God a name that he seems to accept. Accept The place, verse 14, the well was called Ber Lahai Roy. Again, celebrates the same reality. You are a God of seeing the well, the well of the living one who sees me. Uh, and just a wonderful message there. God sees, he's watching, he cares. Uh, and, you know, I hope that's a, a take home for us that, you know, when we see that, that name Arab, Arab in the news to remember who they are, the descendants of Ishmael, the name that says God cares and God sees. Well, there's a, a dis decision to have a child by another wife, not a good one, but there's divine intervention and certainly the grace of God here. And then finally, the child is delivered by her and given the name Ishmael, verse 15 and 16. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So she uh, delivers. He uh, is given the name. Uh, and so apparently, though, Abraham has been pretty checked out uh, up to this point in all this going on. He uh, at this point steps in and believes. Again, she shows up and I'm back, you know. And uh, keep in mind when the angel says, you need to go back and submit to Sarah. Do you know how far I've been walking in this? Desert? You know, I, she, she doesn't say that. Uh, she just gets the bus and... No, she, it's another however many, you know, week and a half, two weeks back through the desert uh, to get back up there again. She doesn't really know the, the welcome that she's going to get. So she does submit to what the Lord has to say and says, obviously, I had a conversation with God. God cares about me and about my child. And God says his name should be Ishmael. And, uh, and Abraham then goes along with that and gives him uh, that, that name. Uh, and later then, when she is dismissed and she has to leave, we do see Abraham jump in and, and care for her. Uh, the other thing about this is that uh, Abram's 86 years old at the time of the delivery, so his body is not yet as good as dead. And that's, that's a problem. That's an issue. God wants to bless Abraham and Sarah. God promises to give them a child. Can he give them a child right away? No, not really, because... I mean, if he's like 87 and he has a child, everybody's going to go, yeah, well, he had one at 86. What's the deal there, right? I mean, God can't really move forward with what he wants to do because they kind of jumped the plans of what God had for them. So there needs to be, so now they've got to wait longer. I wonder how many times, you know, when we, we jump ahead, we make bad decisions. And, uh, you know, God has to hold up on what he wants to do uh, in and through our lives. But that's what we see see here. 
again, Sarah's intervention, Abram's decision may have led to the promise being delayed for another 13 years. Shortcuts don't always promote uh, God's blessing upon our lives. They make a detour here, very interesting, a speed bump. The good thing is that God does intervene, God does save them, God does bring them back, and obviously Abraham and Sarah, as we'll continue our story, get back on track with God, uh, as he does with us. You know, a lot of us um, probably know in here, but people we know in other states that are walking with the Lord have made bad decisions in the past, and... Uh, you know, it's amazing, though, how God will come in. He is that God who sees and cares. And even in our disobedience and doing some pretty dumb things and creating some bad situations that we have to learn to live with as a result, uh, he still comes in with his grace and his mercy and helps us kind of clean the whole thing up. We have to live with consequences sometimes. Uh, it's not, uh, not always easy. There are laws that, uh, that kick in when we do things we shouldn't do. It's been a long time since uh, I've been with somebody that was uh, dying of AIDS, but there was a point in time in, in ministry would, where that, that was a, not an uncommon occurrence. Uh, we don't even talk about it. It's not in the news so much uh, anymore because of the uh, medications that are available. Not, there's no cure, but just to hold off for a number of years, the symptoms and so forth. But a lot of those guys that were in fellowship with us were, of course, coming, had come out of the homosexual community. Uh, God had forgiven them. God had redeemed their lives. They were walking with the Lord. Uh, they were going into hospitals and hospice situations, sharing the gospel, leading others to faith in, in Christ. Uh, they, uh, the two or three guys I'm thinking of in particular had tremendous uh, ministries uh, for a while, but they died of AIDS. Uh, there were still consequences to the, the sin in their life. There's consequences for Abraham and Sarah in this decision, but it doesn't mean that God doesn't jump back into the middle of their lives, that God's grace isn't there and it isn't sufficient to help them deal with, it, with their current situation, what they've created here with this uh, other son now uh, having been, been born. It's been said that, uh, of God that when he cannot rule, he overrules and he always accomplishes his purposes. Uh, but we, boy, it's so much easier when we're at that point of seeking His will, seeking to do what we what we know. You know, you know, it's it's you know, it's hard. You know, some of these issues of seeking God's will. Do I have the apple or the orange? Do I get the blue car or the red car? You know, there's not a scripture verse for that. You know, it's it's kind of tough. But there's a lot in terms of God's moral will. It's very clear. It's very clear where He would have us to be. What His will is for our lives. But Abraham and Sarah, like us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He does that with them. He'll do it with us. He's the God who sees.